Good morning. Come on, you can do better than that. Good morning. I, hey, yeah. I'm still uh, fighting jet lag a little bit, so, uh, but I'm excited about being here. Um, we, we didn't do this earlier. Uh, I have a baptism certificate to give away. Um, we had, I think it was three, three weeks ago. Uh, I've been, no, it was two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. We baptized four people, and when we baptize people, we always give them a baptism certificate the following week because we, we want you to come back, right? And so um, it's a test. Um, and so uh, anyways, one, we gave the other three in the first service today. And uh, this is Carrie. Is Carrie in here? I was told, there she is. Yeah. Come on up. She got baptized two weeks ago. Congratulations. Awesome. All right. I need you to stand with me. Stand. Come on. Let's hear the groans. Every time we do this, stand. We're gonna, I'm going to read one verse out of God's word. And I was in, we just got back from London um, Friday, and we were there for eight days. And uh, I, last Sunday I preached at their church, and I had them stand. And uh, it went better than it always, than it has ever here. Because um, every time you guys get mad at me because you're like, oh, I got to stand up, and you just groan. Over there, people are very obedient, especially to the government. You know what I mean? Like they don't, they, they, if the government tells, or if it, anyone in authority tells them to do something, they just say, yep, I'll do that. And Americans are different, which is what that Revolutionary War was all about. You know, like we, we, don't, want it, we don't want anyone telling us how to live our lives. So anyways, glad you came today because I'm going to tell you how to live your life. A little bit out of God's word. Uh, but one verse in Romans 12, 2, this is what we've been basing this sermon series on. And here's what it says. And I'm going to read it out of, out of this Bible. I use the New Living Translation, and then I'm going to read it to you out of two paraphrases, okay? So here's what it says. It says, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. All right, you can be seated. That's what we're talking about. He says, don't. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. And I want to show you this and go, go to the next slide. Uh, so this is Romans 12 too. This is in the J.B. Phillips paraphrase of this. And uh, I just like the way he says it. Here's what he says. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good, meets all his demands, and moves towards the goal of true maturity. Um, I came across, this, go to the next slide, this sign. I don't know where this is at, but this is a really cool sign. It just says the same thing. Don't let the world squeeze you into its mold. That's what the world is trying to do. And that's, that's what we're talking about today. That's what the sermon series is all about, being countercultural. There's another, go to the next slide. There's another paraphrase. This is from the message paraphrase. I like the way they put it too. It says, don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Isn't that good? I like the way that is. So this series, we started three weeks ago. This is a, just the second one. The last two weeks we've had missionaries here. And uh, so we, we've been talking about counterculture. And go to the next slide. I want to show you. This is a definition. This is just the Oxford definition of counterculture. It's actually a word. It's a way of life and, and set of attitudes opposed to or at variance with the prevailing social norm. So countercultural is, you know, whatever's prevalent uh, in society, what prevalent in society, the, the, the modern view, like the majority view of anything, the way the culture is going. If you want to go against that, we're, you're considered countercultural. Go to the next one. This is from Wikipedia. It says um, a counterculture. A counterculture is a culture whose values and norms of behavior differ differ substantially from those of mainstream society. Sometimes diametrically opposed to mainstream cultural mores, a cultural movement expresses the ethos and aspirations of a specific population during a well-defined era. And so. What, what it is, is we have to look at, for us, in our context, in America in 2021, what is the culture like? 
okay? And the culture is way different than what some of us grew up with. I mean, I'm 47 years old. The, the way the culture is now, for us to be countercultural, means something for uh, the generation before us. So I was born in 74. Does anybody, anybody grow up in the 60s? Let me see your hand. Yeah, you guys did mushrooms. Some of you guys still haven't come back from that, still on a bad trip. But that's what, that's what the 60s were. The 60s were the sexual revolution. It was the sex, drugs, and rock and roll, you know, and nothing wrong with rock and roll. But the, the other stuff, was just, it just, so here's, here's what society looked like in the 1950s and the 60s. It was very traditional. It was very much the way the church was operating was the way society was, that, that was the mainstream. You know what I mean? Like, like if you went to church, you wore a suit and tie, and then when you went to work on Monday, you wore a suit and tie, and, and the women all wore, wore dresses. And, and the church and society was pretty much the social norm. So back then, like with the Beatles and, and everyone else in the 60s, they wanted to be revolutionary. They wanted to be countercultural. So for them to be countercultural meant to, re, like, right, the rebelling against the man, the man's trying to keep you down and all that stuff. And, and so they were considered countercultural in the 60s, which meant, you know, differently than now. So all of the stuff that they wanted to be in the 60s is what society is like now. And so for us, if we want to be countercultural, we have to shun those things. And, and what I'm telling you is let's, let's go back to God's word as Christians. I'm not telling everybody, but I'm saying those of us in this room that are followers of Jesus, let's get back to the word of God. Let's get back to living life the way that God told us to. And if you do that, you will inadvertently be countercultural because the culture is just off the rails. That, that's what we're talking about. Okay, so let's talk about that a little bit. Two weeks ago, or three weeks ago, rather, I started this sermon series, and I talked about cultural fads, okay? So we talked about, like, WWJD bracelets and, and all these, uh, the, the milk, milk crate challenge, all of these things in our society, pe people eating Tide Pods, and uh, I'm glad that one passed pretty fast. But there's all kinds of fads that have come and gone in our, since I've been alive. And that's the way the world is. All around the world, there are passing fads. There are things that get really hot, and everybody's got to have it. You know, uh, when I was growing up, it was tight rolling your jeans and having a mullet and, you know, Z Cavaricis and going to, remember Merry-Go-Round at the Blue Ridge Mall? Come on, who, who remember, who was alive at that time, the Blue Ridge Mall? Come on, that's, that's dating you right there. And, uh, man, that was the best time of our life. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Uh, the 80s was pretty, pretty bad, um, pretty bad fashion. But, uh, but all of that stuff was cultural, and it, it was here, and then one day it wasn't. All the, all the women, when I was in high school, all of the women had big hair. You guys remember that? Huge hair. I mean, it's like a contest. They would, they, they you got, you women literally put a hole in the ozone layer with all the Aquanet you were spraying in your hair. And it was like, let's see how far poofy we could get it. And, um. Uh, it got out of hand, and I'm so I'm glad that era is gone too. Uh, the ozone thanks you for that. But um, so all of those things just come and go. That's what a passing fad is. And my point about that was that in life there are passing fads. They're here one day and then they're gone the next. But God's word is the one thing that's not passing. Like this, this has been around for two thousand years, and it will be around far after you're gone. So if you're wise, you will build your life on the Word of God and on the God of the Bible. And I said before, too, that, that God doesn't change and neither does His Word, so we can base it on it. And I, I appreciate um, people, like people I know that are steady, people I call Steady Eddie. Uh, like two of my best friends are Jeff and Chuck's in here, and both those guys are like steady. Every time I see them... I know what I'm going to get with them. That's why I really enjoy being around them. We go fishing, and um, both of those guys, I've probably seen them riled up maybe once or twice. And they just, they just don't let things affect them. Uh, and uh, I will confess to you, pro people, people that I know that um, get uh, fly off the handle and stuff, I just kind of distance myself from them. Like, I don't want to be around it. You know what I mean? Like, I love to be around people that just are steady. Because I know what I'm going to get from you. Like emotional highs and lows, I don't, I don't like that, right? So, but my point about telling you that is that's how God is. Every day God is consistent. So um, there are some people that are unpredictable, but God is predictable. In fact, he's so predictable, he wrote it down in his word. So everyone in this room, you don't have to wonder 
what does God want from my life? He's already told you in the Bible. All you got to do is pick it up and read it and spend time with God. He's going to reveal his word to you and his will for your life, right? There are so many people, there are so many religions that it's all about do, do this, do this, do this. And there are people in all the other religions, literally every other religion on earth besides Christianity, it's about what you do to try to earn merit with God. And when you talk to people, I mean, I, I talk to some people that are, uh, even what I would consider Christ cults, like like they're always trying to do, uh, uh, it's like, did you do enough to earn God's favor? Do you, and so when you ask them, do you know if you're going to go to heaven when you die? And they're like, well, I hope so, or it's a wait and see. And I'm like, that is so bizarre to me, because if you just read the Bible, there is nothing in my faith that's a hope so. I am 100% certain, beyond a shadow of a doubt, that when I die, I'm going to heaven to be with Jesus. And it's not based on my life. It's not based on anything I've done except for trusting in Christ, right? Because I'm not good enough. I can't do enough good to merit God's favor. Jesus did that for me. And so all I have to do is just accept that. And when I die, that's, the, that's, the, uh, that's salvation, and that's the, um, what am I, th that, that's the assurance of salvation. And I'm blown away at so many people. There are so many religions that are trying to earn God's favor by what they do. And Jesus says, that's not how it works. All you have to do is accept me. So that's what we're, we're talking about today. Um, let's, go, let's get into today. I want to take you back um, to this past week. So me and my wife told you we were in London. Um, I want to share with you what that looked like. So uh, one of the missionaries we support, Justin Rhodes, and he'll actually be here in a couple weeks um, to speak for us. Um, but he... He's gone over to England. He's been there for five years now. He's working with another missionary, and the two of them are pastoring this church, and it's incredible what God is doing in, their, in their, their church. It's amazing. And so I was talking with them on a Zoom call a while back, and they, they wanted to start a recovery ministry. And so in talking about it, they said, why don't you come over and help us get this kicked off? And so that's what we did. Me and my wife went over there, and it was, it was so amazing. So on Sunday morning, I preached, and— um, it was a great service. They, the, the people were just so awesome. And then on Sunday night, we did, the, we did another thing where uh, they don't normally do a Sunday night service, but they did a special evangelistic service. And, so, and I was the keynote speaker, and so they invited all these people. They had 70 first-time guests um, that Sunday night. And one lady came up to me after the service, and she said, I was asking her if she knew Christ, if she'd ever been saved, and she said no, and she was ready to do that. Um, she, she act, they actually had her come into their office on Tuesday, and she accepted Christ. And so that was, that was worth the trip right there for me. But, and then on Thursday, they kicked off their recovery group. And they have, they have a lot of people who go to AA, and they're involved in recovery of some sort. And so they, ju they just wanted to have a Christian version of that, like, at church. And so um, we had a, an amazing group. Some of you guys prayed for that on Thursday night. And... Um, and, and I got to speak to them, and it, it, just went, it just went incredible. And I was just blown away at, at the culture over there and how, how great things look. There are some things, uh, I just wanted to talk about this, about the culture in London is way different than here. You probably figured that, and I, I knew that going in, but I didn't know exactly what. First of all, they all talk weird. You know what I mean? Like, they all talk, uh, it, I mean, they, they speak English, but it's a different kind of English. And I thought, some of them I can understood pretty good, and other people I was like, I had, they would say a, wor a sentence and I would process it, okay, I think I know what they said. And then I found out after I preached to them that some of them had a hard time understanding me, which my mind doesn't comprehend that because I talk normal. Everyone else talks weird, you know what I mean? And, uh, but it's just, it, it, it is what it is. And so everyone over there drives on the wrong side of the road, you know that? And their roads are so small, their cars are really, really tiny. Everyone drives a stick shift, and they're all diesel uh, engines. It's just, it's just weird. Like, I didn't see a single pickup truck the whole time I was over there. I was like, I couldn't live here. You know, I, I got to have a pickup truck. That's just, <laughs> that's life for us in America. But anyways, um, the, uh, the food, people asked me about the food, and the food was awesome. We, we ate a lot of different, uh, from nationalities, different, we had some Indian food. And we went to this Indian restaurant, and it was you know, if you go to an Indian restaurant here, like an authentic one, um, your mouth is going to be on fire, and the next day is going to hurt you too. You know what I'm talking about? But not there. Like we had, my wife and I had some Indian food, and it wasn't spicy at all. I'm like, what's going on here? Like they don't like spicy stuff at all. You know what they do like? 
they have like frank and beans for almost every meal and i'm like with mix them with almost and i was like i couldn't do that like that that's 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 kind of a that's like ramen noodles over here you know it's like we don't we you do that if you're poor you know come on let's be honest you do that when you're in college and you're just scraping to get by i know some of you guys like ramen noodles and pork and beans i'm not trying to insult you i'm just saying um <laughs> anyways i'll move on um but the uh they don't know what barbecue is there which was the hardest thing to be honest with you um i got we justin justin rhodes our missionary he had a barbecue one night and because he's from kansas city so he knows he knows real barbecue and we had a conversation he goes when i first got over here he goes somebody from the church invited me over they said hey come to our house we're gonna have a barbecue this weekend and he goes he went over there and it was like it was like a salad bar with some hot dogs and he was like, this is, not a, this is not a barbecue. And I would be offended at that. I'm just, if, you ever, if you ever have a barbecue and invite me over, I don't want to see anything green. You know, if I have a barbecue and I invite you over there, I can guarantee you there's not going to be any salad. There's nothing green. There's going to be like some ribs and some steak and some brats. And it's going to be all meat is what it is. That's a barbecue. Come on now. Uh, salad is what my food eats. All right. We, we don't eat. Anyways, which... Which is why we have an obesity problem in our country. But anyway, so that's a, that's a different topic altogether. Um, there, there was a, so I don't know how much, how much you guys know about English history. There, um, we, we went and did this tour of the Tower of London. You know what the Tower of London is? So William the Conqueror in 1066 was the first, he conquered England, and he was the first king of England, and he built this tower. It was, it's an impressive tower. It's still standing a thousand years later. And so we toured the tower, and there was a guy giving us a tour. Uh, he's, they're called beef eaters, um, I, I think, because way, they started giving tours hundreds of years ago, and they got to eat from the king's table, so they got to eat meat. Anyways, um, but he was funny. So one of the things that he said, he goes, he go, there was a big crowd, probably 50 people in our group. And he goes, are there any Americans in the crowd? And there was probably like 10, and we raised our hand. He goes, do you like the history of England? And everyone was like, yeah. He goes, well, it could have been yours if you paid your taxes. And I was like, I thought that was pretty funny. Which, which again, I'm just telling you, like, there's a difference between English people, like in England, and Americans. Um, that, this is what the Revolutionary War was all about. We don't like, we don't like anybody telling us what to do. No, I'm serious. You guys, you guys may not realize that because you've lived your whole life. That's why some of you guys have multiple guns, and you're like, if, if the government ever does this, I'm, I'm, you know, you got your musket and all this stuff. It's just a different culture. Nobody over there has guns. They're not allowed to have guns. They don't even want them. They, they think that we're weird for having guns and things like that. And I'm like, I think you're weird for not having a gun. But anyways, it's, uh, it's just what it is. And um, there is such a thing as culture shock, and I'm not going to belabor this point, but there uh, one of the, the missionary, Terrell's, Terrell, uh, Tarl, his wife, Adrian, said when she got over there, she had severe culture shock because they moved their family. They have three kids, and so they're living in this country where they don't know anybody, and they're trying to get adjusted to the culture and the time change and all that, and, sh and they had culture shock. And so I just thought that was interesting. I'll talk more about that later. But let's go back to this. Um, we're, today what we're talking about is, is God's way versus the world's way. And if you'll just listen to me for a second, my mind, I'm, I'm a pretty simplistic person. And when I first started going to church 20, in, in 1997, um, you, you guys were there, uh, Roger and Sherry. But we, we were going to, I started going to church, and uh, one of my, my best friend at the time was the youth pastor, Nate Day. And he, when he would teach the youth, almost every week he would talk about there's God's way and then there's the world's way. And, and he he just made it so simplistic and that's the way my, that my mind i'm like it's it's easy like every day i wake up it, i can either go god's way or the world's way and and jesus taught this principle and if you have a bible i want you to turn to matthew 7 so this is from the sermon on the mount sermon on the mount was matthew 5 6 and 7 and so this is what he taught this is one of the things that jesus taught i'm just going to read verse 13 he goes he goes you can enter god's kingdom only through the narrow gate the highway to hell is broad, and its gate is wide for many who choose that uh, for the for the many who choose that way. But the gateway to life is very narrow, and the road is difficult, and only a few ever find it. So, if you got a pen, if you're if you circle things in your Bible, I want you to circle the word narrow, and I want you to circle the word broad. 
Because that's what Jesus said. He goes, he goes the, the road to God, God's way, is a narrow way. And the other way is the road to destruction, and it's broad. He said, most people are on that road, to be honest. That's what he said. And uh, he, he called, Jesus called it the highway to hell. And here you thought it was just a song by ACDC, right? And, and it was, it's more than just a song. It's a reality, right? That's what Jesus was teaching. So he goes, it's pretty simple. He was like, God's way is narrow and because there's very few people that go on there. Like, just think about it. Like, there's, there's times when I've, um, I've gone on hikes and I've been in a group and, there, and, and, and we've been to situations where there's like a trail that's not very many people go and it goes up to the top. And I'm like, and I'm always the person. I'm like, I want to go down that trail. I want to go up that trail to see what's up there. And when you get up there, that's when the beautiful, the most beautiful views are seen. And the reality is that a lot of people don't want to go that extra mile. And that's fine. But you're not going to experience all that you can experience in life unless you climb a little bit higher. But what Jesus is saying is there's two roads in life. There's the broad way, which the majority of society is going down that road. And you don't have to do anything different than what you're doing. But he goes, the road. To the, the road that leads to life is narrow. And listen, I, I want to be honest with you guys when I tell you this, that this road that, that I take, that I've chosen to take, um, is hard at times. And uh, let, I'll give you an example. Like a few years ago, we dealt with, uh, again, Roger and Shel Sherry and some of you guys, we, we all dealt with this thing about um, there was a, a view that, of universalism where they just believe that everybody goes to heaven and and when I was having those de debates and discussions with with the guy that believes this I was like if I believe that listen if I believed that you could just live any way you want and when you die you're gonna go to heaven I would not go to church that that's just me Michelle Michelle's with me on that too we all pro went through this stuff but I and I hate to burst your bubble I like you guys a lot I wouldn't want to do, I have the best job in the world, and I wouldn't want to do any other thing. Seriously, if you came to me and said you could have this other job, and it pays millions of dollars, I like what I'm doing now. Now, you want to give me a raise? That's fine. But, but I, seriously, because I know that what I do with this job, this is not just a job for me. It's not a career. I'm, I get to see people's lives change for eternity. There's nothing better that I want to do with my life, honestly. But if I believed that everyone was going to go to heaven, and you could just live any way you want, I would stop going to church because sometimes, just to be honest, some of you guys are hard to get along with at times. You know what I mean? Like, I would just go fishing every Sunday. I'd go play golf. I would just party it up, and I would just go, oh, I'll just take care of it in the afterlife. But that's not what Jesus taught. And if you're a person that believes the Bible like I do, then you can't live your life that way. You have to understand that Jesus made it very clear that to live your life, there's the narrow road and there's the broad road. But, but the narrow road is worth it. Because we're going to live our lives, and living for Jesus, it takes sacrifice. Come on, some of you guys didn't want to come here today. Some of you guys, you woke up this morning, the alarm went off, and you went snooze. And you went snooze 10 minutes later, and 10 minutes later, snooze, snooze. And then you were really thinking, man, I could skip this Sunday. I just watch online. And there's people watching online because they did that. And I want to say to you, shame on you. You guys know who you are. Uh, you should be here with us. But... But, it's, but you decided to get up and get your kids ready, and, and it's hard, and you guys got here, and God is going to reward you and bless you for, for those hard decisions. And when you, when you tithe, when you give of your time, when you do things for God, it is hard. Live, who, whoever said living for Jesus is easy? Nobody, Jesus never said that. In fact, in America, the culture in which we survive in, in which we live in, is so radically different than, the, than most of the world. Like right now in Afghanistan today, like, like God is, Jesus is asking you to, here's what the deal is. He says, there's the broad, there's the broad road and there's the narrow road. I want you to choose the narrow road. But in Afghanistan right now, somebody's going to take out a knife or a sword and put it to somebody's throat who's a Christian. And they're going to say, they're going to ask them, now, there's a road. There's the narrow road and there's the, the wide road. Which are you going to choose? And for those that say, I'm sticking with Jesus, they're going to get their heads chopped off. And they get to go to eternity with Jesus, right? That's the reward. But there are some people throughout the world that would, that, that would choose the other way. I don't want to die, so I'm going to compromise my faith. And in fact, hey, Craig, will you bring me that sword that's back there? Because we're going to test some people right now. I'm just kidding. There's no sword back there. I'm joking. But seriously, 
can I, can I just, can I get in your business a little bit? Can I just be honest with you and, and just kind of, all right? Most of you guys in this room, God is not asking you to die for him, but he is asking you to live for him. And if you can't even get your butts up and come to church on Sunday morning, what makes you think when someone puts a sword to your throat that you're going to say yes to Jesus? It's not going to happen. There are, when, when you say yes to everything other than God, everything, you say yes to everything other than coming to church, when, when the, it's really on the line, you're, you're not going to stand up for him. And neither am I. That's why it's practice. I know, I know, look, I can feel the looks. I can already feel you guys judging me right now. But this is the truth. And so, th- here, let me, just, let me do the rest of my sermon. And if you still feel that way, we'll, we'll talk. But um, so, so Jesus goes, there's the highway to hell and there's the narrow road. And um, so the, let, let me talk about this because there's two applications of this, okay? And let me, let me just help you understand this. So in my mind, I see there's the, if you're a Bible person, you know that there's the Babylonians and then there's the Corinthians. They, not at the same time. But, but there's the culture of the Babylonians and then there's the, and then just go with me. And then there's the culture of the Corinthians. So the Babylonians is this. The, the children of Israel, who were God's people, got captured by King Nebuchadnezzar and taken into Babylon. So now they're in a foreign land, and the culture is way different. And it's different than what they're used to. They're trying to follow God. And so now King Nebuchadnezzar sets up a 90-foot statue, and he says, you're going to bow down and you're going to worship me, this statue, or you're going to get thrown in the fiery furnace. So now the children of Israel have a choice, right? And that's the story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, where they said, I'm not going to bow to this 90-foot statue. I will only bow to Jesus. I will only bow to God. And they got thrown in the fiery furnace, and Jesus was in there walking around and dancing with them, right? You know that whole story. And, and so, but that was their choice. And some of you guys, you're, for you, it's Babylon, because you grew up in church. You've been around church your whole life or for a long time. And for you, it's like, I need to stick with God, but there's constant temptation. Do I want to bow to the 90-foot statue, or, or do I go with God? And if you bow to the, if, if you bow to the 90-foot statue, that puts you on the outs with God. That's just how it works. But if you say, no, I'm not going to bow, you might lose your job. You might get made fun of. You might lose some friends. You might get divorced. Or there's a number of things that might happen to you in our country because you say, because you're a follower of Jesus, right? Now, the other one is the Corinthian culture. Now, the Apostle Paul goes to, the, to Corinth, and he starts a church there. He leads a bunch of people to Christ. Now, all of these people, not some of them, all of them were pagans before they met, uh, before they met Paul, which means that they went to, to the temple, and part of their temple-going experience was they would go and have sex. Like, their temple was notorious for having a thousand prostitutes in there. So part of their church experience was going and having sex with prostitutes and all this. And the Apostle Paul comes along, and he's trying to teach them about purity. And he's trying to teach them God's way. And there, and, and there are many people that got saved, and they built a church. And when he writes First and Second Corinthians, he's trying to get them to understand, you. They, they're like me. So I consider myself a Corinthian-type person because I wasn't raised in church. And at the age of 23, I started going to church. And all of this was new. The pastor would get up and preach out of the Bible, and he would tell me things like, you know, God cares about your sex life. Like, you can't just sleep with whoever you want. Like, and I, that was the first time I heard about it. When, when Pastor Otis stood up and preached from the Bible and said that God expects me to wait till I get married to have sex, I was like, no, really? I mean, I'm serious. I was blown away. I was like, why? Why? Why would he do that? And, and people had to explain it. And it wasn't their opinion. They opened the Bible, and they showed me what God says. And you know what? It made sense. It's rational. God makes sense to me. God, God is in control. God, God is not irrational. He doesn't ask us to, to do things that aren't for our best interest. So I was like, so I was like, everything in my life, every time Pastor Otis would get up and preach, it went in direct contradiction to the way I was living my life. So I had a choice. Do I want to keep living the world's way, like the, like the Corinthian way, or do I want to take a step back and start going God's way? And that's where many of you guys are. Some of you guys grew up in church, and your temptation is to fall in line with the Babylonians. But God's like, no, stick with me, and you'll be all right. Others of you, when I preach about this stuff, this is the first time you've ever heard it before. You know, and some of the stuff I teach is very, very hard to grasp. But I'm sympathetic toward you, to you, toward you because I was there at one time. In fact, if you come back next week, I've been dreading this sermon for a long time. 
But next week, I'm going to be talking about sex. And uh, there are so many people who are confused. And next week, when, I te- when I, we just walk through what the culture says about sex and what God says about sex in, his, in the Bible, um, and I'm not going to get, so I'm not going to get graphic and things, so, but I do think there are a lot of people confused. There are, um, we have a youth department that's going, youth group that's going on right now, and those kids go to public school, and the message that they're getting at school is radically different than what God says in his word. And so I feel a sense of responsibility that I'm, look, I, I'm going to stand before God when I die and give an account. Not, I'm not standing before you guys. You might judge me now. But God judges me on judgment day. You know what I mean? Like, I don't want you to be offended, but I promise you next week some people will get up and walk out. They just will, and they won't ever come back. And they'll go tell people that we're haters and all this stuff. And I'm going to be like, look, I don't hate anybody. Seriously, I, I don't hate anybody, but I'm just a person who follows this book. And if your problem is the fact that is with this book, then that's your problem, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my very best not to offend you intentionally next week. I'm, I'm, I really am. But I'm going to tell you what God's word says about this, and then you can do with it whatever you want, right? That's just how we're going to live. I don't, I don't think that we do young people, anybody, I don't, think we, I don't think I do you any favors by not telling you the truth. I want to live, I want you to tell me the truth. If I go to the doctor and I have cancer, I just want you to tell me the truth so we can attack it, so we can fix it early. But I don't need you to sugarcoat it for me. I just need you to tell me the truth. That's how it is with God's word. And so next, next week, just come back. We'll see how it goes. Um, I'm going to wear my bulletproof vest. Uh, and so we'll see how it goes. Um, let, me read, let me read to you this passage the, from 2 Corinthians. So I was talking about the Corinthian culture. And here's 2 Corinthians 6. Uh, you should go back and read this whole chapter. It's, it's fascinating. You should read the whole book of First and 2 Corinthians. It's, it's, it's an amazing two books. But here's what he says. He goes, Therefore... Come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them, says the Lord. I love that because if you know the context, he's talking to people who were raised in pagan temples. And now he's like, okay, you've made a decision to follow Christ. And he goes, and I learned this in the King James, that's what I memorized. And it says, come out from among them and be ye separate. Right, we don't, in England, you know, it's the old King James, ye and thee and thou and all that. But I just like the way that that sounds. He says, come out from among them. And that's what he's saying from you. Come out from among them and be separate. So what I want to do for the rest of the time in here is I want to talk to you about what it looks like to be separate from the world. Because some people think it means being weird and awkward, socially awkward. You know what I mean? Like, I look, I know some people that are just, you don't, you don't want to be around them because they're just they just have all these rules and regulations, and, and I don't want to, this message is not about telling you how to live your life. If, if, you, if you come to me and say, well, Pastor Joey, what about these movies, or what about this music? Look, you have the Holy Spirit that can rule your life, but if you spend time in God's Word and you spend time with God, there are, and I'll just tell you my personal, because most of you guys know this, okay, but uh, when I first started going to church, 1997, all of, all of the stuff, music that I, look, we used to have CDs. You, young people don't know what CDs are. They, they, try to, they try to throw them like crazy. But we used to have CDs, and I had all these CDs from gangster rap. It was terrible. Like, like it was the kind of stuff that I loved. I won't go through the list of all of them. But, but once I got saved, I had uh, a decision. Do I, do I want to continue to fill my mind with hardcore gangster rap that degrades women and glorifies selling drugs and that whole culture. That's what I was filling my mind with. And my worship pastor, the worship pastor at the time at where I went to church, he challenged me on that. He goes, why don't you listen to some good stuff? And, okay, I'm going to make some people mad on this one. So I was like, I didn't know there was Christian music. Where, where do I find it? And he showed me some stuff. And when I got to Springfield to go to Bible college, there was, some, uh, there was a station that played Southern Gospel. You got some, uh, look, I don't mean to offend anybody, but I listened to that, and I was like, if that's Christian music, I'll just listen to silence. You know what I mean? Because I just, I wasn't into it, the, the, the barbershop quartet type thing. I just, I just wasn't into that. It just wasn't my cup of tea. Now, maybe you love that, and I'm not trying to offend you about that, but it just wasn't me. And then I discovered a group called the Cross Movement. You may have never heard of them before, but in 1997, 1998, they were 
they, they were rappers, and it was like gangster rap, but with all, all of the glorifying violence and degrading women and all that. You know what they were doing? They were taking passages out of the Bible, and they were putting rap to it. And they were, it sounded like the stuff I used to listen to, but the words were glorifying to God. They talk about theology and stuff. And other pastors were telling me, that's not godly. Why? Because it's not the kind of music you listen to or like? And, and I was like, listen to the words. As a matter of fact, one time I went to a pastor's meeting. They had me preach, and I played one of those songs <laughs> during the thing. I was like, because I want you to hear the lyrics. Don't listen to the music. Listen to the lyrics. And some of them came up and apologized to me afterwards. They were like, that's better than some of the hymns that we sing at our church. You know? And so my point is just, there's, there's a choice. Do I want to fill my mind with movies and songs and, you know, all, all of the TV shows, all of this stuff that's counter to the way God wants me to live my life? Or, or do I want to put in some positivity? And this is a choice that we have to make in our lives. And so there, I just wanted to talk about that. All right, now, let me give you three thoughts and then we're going to be done. All right, three, the first thought is this, just about what we're talking about. We need to learn what the distinctions, uh, what are the distinctions between culture and the Bible, okay? And again, this is not, I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to get up here and tell you the music you listen to is trash. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that the TV episodes that you listen to. I'm, I'm not going to do all that. You, like I said before, you have the Holy Spirit. I think I would challenge you, though, to look at the intake in your life. Look at the things that you allow to influence your life on social media and other things. And just say, is, is this helping me or hurting me as it relates to me trying to follow Jesus? And you can come to your own conclusions on that. But here, I want to read this verse in Isaiah 55. This is, this is an amazing passage. And this will really inform us on what we're talking about. This is what God says. He goes, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord. And my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. I want, let me give you an example of this, okay? So, so God says, you don't think like me. Like you, don't, you couldn't possibly think like me. Like, my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so, a few years ago, back to the universalism thing I was talking about, there was a, in response to that, of people saying, there, there were people saying there's no hell. There's no such thing as hell. When people die, everyone's just going to go to heaven. And I was like, you know, hey, I wish that were true, but that's just not true. You know, I, I don't want to lie to you. And so, there was a guy named Francis Chan. He's a pastor, a preacher, and he wrote a book called Erasing Hell. And in one of the videos he uses to promote that, it's, it is credible. He goes, this, this is what he said. I'll just try to recap it for you. He goes, I have conversations with people, and they will say something to the effect of, well, I would never believe in a God that would send anybody to hell. And, and he goes, these are church people. These, some of these are church people saying, I could never believe in a God that would send anybody to hell. And he, this is what he said. And this is, in my mind, it just helped me so much. He goes, so what you're saying is that you would never believe in a God that wouldn't, exact, that wouldn't act exactly the way you would act. You know what I mean? Think about that. God already said, your ways are not like my ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. And so if you are at a point where you could never believe in a God that wouldn't behave and act and think just the way that you behave and act and think, then the God that you worship is the fi figment of your imagination. It's certainly not the God of the Bible. Do you understand what I'm saying? Come on, I don't... I don't have to, yeah, thank you. This point is not that hard to prove because you, you and I, we don't always make the best decisions. Like I look at what God does, I look at how God asks me to live my life sometimes, and I'm like, no, that's hard. But every time I've ever said yes to God and followed his, his will, I've always, never one time have I regretted that. My only regrets are the time that God asked me to do something or led me to do, and I said no. I said, I think I know a little bit better than you. Like, I would never say that to him, but my actions speak louder than words. And so I've just learned through the years that God is a good God, and God, God's ways are high. And so I don't always understand why he operates the way he does. But if God thinks and acts just the way that I do, then that's probably a good indicator that I'm not worshiping the God of the Bible. It's a God that I created in my own mind. Because God is separate from us, all right? So this is something for you to think about. I want you to, number two, I want you to think about this. Morality is the first thing to go when a culture abandons God. 
And I know time's getting away from me, so I will flesh this out uh, at one of my later sermons. But I'll just read Judges 21, 25. I read this last time. It says, in those days Israel had no king, and all the people did what seemed right in their own eyes. And I talked last time about how, what would it look like in a society if everybody just did what they seemed right? And I was like, that's basically what America looks like today. Everyone just like, everyone in this room has a different moral system. You have a different sense of morality. And so who, who, do, we, who do we let be in charge? Like who's going to run the country? Who's going to dictate our lives? And, and everyone's got a, a differing view on everything. And the only thing that makes sense to me is if we just make the Bible our standard, right? Let's be people of the Bible, and that will keep us from going off the tracks. I'll give you a couple of examples by this. And I know this is going to make me sound like an old person, a fuddy-duddy to some people. I, but I'm just telling you, so this is where we're at in America. So the other day, I was on TikTok, and some people hate TikTok. There's a lot of foul stuff on there, but the... But my TikTok, just when I'm scrolling through it, it's all fishing and hunting videos, which is what it should be. You know what I mean? Can I get an amen? But uh, so I was, I was scrolling, and I saw this video. It's just TikTok's just a social media platform. And, it's, um, and so I was scrolling, and there was a little boy fishing. I was like, oh, this would be cool. And this little boy, probably three years old, and he's, he pulls it. He's, he's reeling in this fish, and he brings it in. And it's a good-sized catfish. It's probably like a four- or five-pound catfish out of this pond. And he brings it up, and he's so excited, and he turns, and his grandpa's right behind him, and whoever has the, the camera filming is just laughing. And he turns the camera, and he was like, that's a great fish, and he starts cussing up a storm, like F-bombs and everything. And, and I'm looking at that in horror. I'm like, what is going on? And, and then the grandpa goes up and pats him on the back. He was like, that's awesome. And he was encouraging, encouraging him in the way he talked. And whoever was running the camera, I think it was a woman, she was laughing. She, they thought it was great. They were teaching that little boy, three years old, how to talk like that. And so what I did was I was like, well, let me go to the comments. And I was like, I want to see what people are saying. And I looked at the comments, and there were thousands of comments. And I bet I looked through 100 of them, and I didn't see one negative comment. They were almost all affirming to teaching that little boy how to talk like that. And, and one of them was, one of them, I just remember, I think I wrote it down, I'm not sure. It said, it said something to the effect of, um, this, guy, this guy said, I'm so glad we live in a society where we can change and people can talk any way they want or something like that. But a little boy, three years old, and everyone, all the following responses to that were like, amen, brother, you're, that's right. And I was just like, I feel like I'm in the twilight zone. Like, what is going on here? And you may not think that that's a big deal. But we live in a society where that stuff is just encouraged now. And there's no sense of morality anywhere in our culture. In fact, if you just listen to that story and you cringed and you think that's horrible, you're weird in society nowadays. You know what I'm talking about? But that's okay. I'd rather be weird than go along with this culture and this society. Uh, a few years ago, when my, all of my kids were smaller, um, I took, I think, I think it was three of them, just me. My wife didn't go. She's a Packers fan, but uh, we, I, it was me and like three of my kids um, went to the Chiefs game, and uh, we sat way up top, and we got cheap tickets, or maybe they were given to us, I can't remember, but uh, it was it was first time I'd taken several of my kids to, to the Chiefs game, and so anyways, we were up there, and uh, it was the worst experience that I've ever had with them. I, like, I would never, I'll never take my kids back. All, people were just spilling beer everywhere. They were so rowdy. People were cussing. Uh, the guy right in front of us was cussing up a storm. And at one point, uh, there was like a lady like in front of me next to him, and she kind of pointed up to my kids and shook her head in disgust at the way he was acting and talking. And he looked back and just cussed us out. And he was like, kids shouldn't be here. This is an adult venue. He was like, this is not a family-friendly place and all this stuff. And I was just, I wanted to punch him in his throat. That's what I wanted to. But I, but I, I just thought, how bizarre is this? That we've turned stuff like, same thing at the Royals game. You, I can't take my kids to stuff like that. You pretty mu I pretty much can't take my kids out in public to places like that because it's so bizarre. It's so foreign that, that people would, you know, mind what they say because there's kids present. And, and look, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to go and complain and say everyone at the Chiefs needs to talk a certain way. I'm just going to say I, I'm not taking my kids back there. You know what I mean? That's where we're at in our society. Because that is normal in the way that I believe is foreign. Like I'm countercultural. 
But I'm okay with being like that. It's just bizarre because I, I grew up in this country and it used to, there used to be respect for women and children. There used to be, you know, people would cuss up, you know, playing poker or out with your boys or whatever. But when they, they get around children, they would watch their tongue. Not now, not now. It's the same thing goes. And if you think, if, if, if you think that's wrong, then you're weird is the way, the way it is now. So I've got some other stuff that I'm going to skip over, but uh, let, let me ask you to think about this for a minute. Uh, going back to what Jesus said, he goes, he goes the, the, the narrow road is, is narrow and few find that. There's few people on that. He goes, the other road is broad, and, and most people are on that. Let's just be honest. And, and so I thought about that, and I thought, well, the problem with a lot of Christians is they don't want to be in the minority. And they're like, they're, they're like, well, everybody's doing it. Like, when you were growing up, did you ever tell your mom, well, everybody's doing it. And she would tell you, remember what she told you? She's like, well, if everybody jumped off a bridge, would you? And I always said, probably, you know, seems fun to me. I don't know. Sounds like a lot of fun. But, but that's the way it is. Like, like, if everybody jumped off a bridge, would you? But it seems like everybody in our culture and society is jumping off a bridge. And here we are as Christians. We're standing up at the edge of the cliff going, I are you going to jump or are you going to follow God? That's the choice that each of us has to make. And I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to say, I'm, as for me and my family, we're going to follow the Lord. You can do whatever you want. I want you to come with me because this is going to be a lot more fun. All right. People have this idea that if I, follow, if I, if I become a Christian and I start going to church every week, God is going to take all the fun. Oh, God, God's a cosmic killjoy. Look, I have more fun now than I did when I was unsaved but I don't wake up in jail the next day. That's the only difference. I have way more fun. And that's the way life is supposed to be. I'm just telling you. But I want you to understand, don't feel temptation to go with the crowd because the crowd is often wrong. You know the majority of the people in this country at one time thought slavery was a good idea? Do you know that? Like almost everybody in America was like, yeah, we should own black people. Yeah, why not? Right? And if you, if you lived in the 1700s or the 1800s, early 1800s, and you believed that owning black people was wrong, you were countercultural. You, you were not in the majority. You were in the minority. You understand how crazy that is? That, how, that everyone in this room thinks, of course we're not going to own people. That's bizarre. Why would you do that? But if you lived 200 years ago, you'd be like, yeah, why not own a black person? So the majority is often wrong. At one time, the majority of the people in Germany thought it was a good idea to murder 6 million Jews. Right? So if you were a German 70 years ago or whenever that was, would you have just gone along with the crowd and just put people in the gas chambers? Or would you say, no, this is wrong. There are certain things that you say no to. I don't care if it's the government. I don't care if it's everybody at church is doing it. Listen, I don't care if I'm the only one following God. I'm not going to bow to the 90-foot statue. I don't, I don't care, to be honest. You know? And I, don't, I know I'm not the only one. But I just want you to understand that the majority is often wrong. Case in point, the McRib. You know what I mean? Like, that's a, whoever thought that was a good idea. Anyways, let me give you, let me read this last passage, or there's two passages. But um, this is in 1 John 2. I think this will help you. Here's what God says. God says, don't love the world. Do not love this world, nor the things it offers, offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only craving for physical pleasure, the craving, uh, a craving for everything we see, and the pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from the world, from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. Uh, but anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. So everything that you chase after with your money and career and achievements is all a passing fad. The only thing that's going to stand true is the Bible, okay? Let me give you the third thing, and then I'm going to be done after this next passage. The third thing is this. Let's, this is just like a final thought. Let's conform to the image of God and be uh, rebels in the culture. Okay, that, that's what we are. Like, the majority of people in our society is going down the wide path. It's the road to the destruction. And so we want to be rebels against that. Because everything a generation ago that they thought they were countercultural, now we don't want to be a part of that. So that makes us countercultural. Cultural. Um, here's what Mark Driscoll's got a, a quote. He says this. 
he goes, he, had, he did this sermon, and he was talking about being a rebel. And he goes, if you want to be a rebel, then read your Bible, because nobody's doing that anymore. Think about that. So if you want to be a rebel, if you want to be countercultural, then go to church. Raise your family in church. Read your Bible every day. Spend time with God, and you will be a rebel. Go to the next slide. This will make some of you mad. Watch this. Do you know who this is? You know, this is Alice Cooper. Now, Alice Cooper was like in the 80s, and he's still around now. But I don't know, most people don't, most Christians don't know that he's a Christian. And he's always, he's been a Christian for all of that time. He's never done drugs. He doesn't drink alcohol. He goes to church every Sunday. But he looks like this. And I've talked to some Christians that are like, Christians shouldn't look like that. Okay, it's just a costume for him. I, I don't like it either, but I, I'm not going to dress like that. But I'm not going to judge the guy. Because every time someone puts a microphone in his face, he's like, let me tell you about Jesus and how he changed my life. It's awesome. And here's the quote. He goes, drinking beer is easy. Trashing your hotel is easy. But being a Christian, that's rebellion. That's, that's rebellion. And that's hard. It's hard to live for God. So there's, we're going to skip over this video. I had a video that we're going to show three weeks ago. We're going to skip it again today because we don't have time, and I'll show it next week maybe. Um, I want to end with this. I want to end with this passage. This is Matthew 7. This is how Jesus wrapped up the Sermon on the Mount. And here's what he says. He goes, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is, what's the word there? Wise. You should circle that if, you take, if you're writing in your Bible. He says, like a person who builds his house, builds a house on solid rock. He goes, though the rains come in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it was built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey is, what's the word? Foolish. He says, he goes, that's foolish. He goes, like a person who builds a house on sand when the rains uh, and floods come and the winds beat against that house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. So Jesus says, here's the road. There's the narrow road and there's the wide road. And he goes, he goes if you build, and it's about how, what are you going to base your life on? What are you right now building your life on? Is it on the solid rock of God's word or is it on shifting sand? Because here's what Jesus didn't say. Jesus didn't say, if the storms of life come your way, he said, when. Everyone in this room is going to experience the winds of life, the storms of life. Everyone in here is going to have a loved one die. Everyone in here knows somebody who died of COVID. Everyone in here is, not everyone in here is going to escape all of these problems of the world, right? We face trials and persecutions, and I don't know who lied to us and told us, if you just follow Jesus, you know, the narrow road, it's going to be awesome and easy, and you won't ever have problems. No, no. In fact, following this road brings more problems with it but it's worth it because you're living for an audience of one you're trying to please the one who created you and the one who will stand you will stand before on judgment day and in the end that's all that matters it is all that matters so let's bow our heads would you just bow your heads and close your eyes just for a moment and i want you to would you just ask yourself the question what what do i base my life on right now like what up to this point what have I been building my family, my life, my career, my value system on? Is it based on God's word that doesn't change? Is it based on God's sense of morality? Or is it, is it worldly? It, it, just ask yourself the question, am I too worldly? Do, when people look at me, do they even know I'm a Christian? Do they even associate me with the God of the universe? Or would people... Seriously, tomorrow would you go to work, if you told someone you're a Christian, would they just gasp and go, really? You? That's, that's a hard pill to swallow. But the good news is this, that tomorrow is a brand new day. So it doesn't matter how you've lived your life up until now. I'm asking you to, to go with me on the narrow road. Stop trying to walk down the broad road. Stop trying to please people. Stop trying to fit in with the crowd. The crowd will never accept you. Have you realized that by now? They will, they will wave you on. They would say, hey, come with us. And when you go with them, they just accuse you. And they say, you're just a compromiser. You call yourself a Christian, but all you do is compromise your faith. Jesus is the one that's got your back. So don't abandon him. Let's walk with him this week. I want you to think about this week, what areas in our lives 
are we compromising our, our values, our Christian values? And let's just get back to the Word of God. I, w- I want to challenge you. Some of you guys, you're, you, you call yourself a Christian and you're saved, but you haven't spent time in God's Word in a long time. Go this week and spend t- open up God's Bible. Open up God's Word and read the Bible and let God work in your life. God, God's not going to work in your life if you don't spend time in His Word. It's just how it works. So let's do that this week. And I know that this, this message is a little hard-hitting. And next week's going to be real hard-hitting. Uh, but I think you can handle it. I, I do. I think, I think that God's able to minister to you. And, and we're just going to do what God says. And I want you to join me in this journey. The last thing I want to say is, what, before we get out of here, listen. There might be someone in here, and I, I don't want to leave until, until I ask you this question. And the question is, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Has there ever been a time in your life where you have repented of your sin and turned your life over to Jesus Christ? Where you came to a point where you understood that I'm a sinner and my sin has separated me from God. And, and I need, like there's something missing in my life. And it is a relationship with Jesus Christ. Man, God loves you so much. He's got this amazing plan for your life, but he can't fulfill any of it until you first surrender your life to Jesus and his, his will for your life. And so right now with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, I don't normally do this. I'm, I'm not going to embarrass anybody or call you out, make you stand up or anything, but I just wonder if, if somebody is sitting here right now and you say, and you would raise your hand and you say, Pastor Joey, that's me. I've never accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I've never done that. I've never really fully committed my life to Jesus Christ, but I want to. Anybody like that? Yeah, I, I don't see any hands. And I don't know how I feel about it because I feel like there's some people that you want to raise your hand. Listen, just come see me after the service or, or get with me this week and we'll come in my office and we'll have a sit down talk and I'll open God's word and I'll show you what the Bible says about God's plan for your life. He loves you. He wants you have a relationship with him all right so let's go out this week and let's just live for god let's go down the narrow path and uh, god will handle the rest all right let's pray together god thank you so much uh for your word um it changes our lives god thank you for the people here i love this church 